All right, listen the fuck up because we're about to get into some uncomfortable truth about why people cheat. Not the sugar-coated, everyone-makes-mistakes bullshit, but the actual science behind why your partner might be sliding into someone else's DMs, or worse, their bed. Let's start with the cold, hard facts. Studies show that roughly 20% of married men and 13% of married women admit to cheating on their spouse. Those numbers jump even higher in dating relationships. And let's be real, those are just the people who actually admitted it. The real numbers? Probably high enough to make your trust issues seem completely rational. Now, I'm not here to justify cheating. Cheaters can go fuck themselves, literally since that's apparently what they're so desperate to do anyway. But understanding the science might help you spot the red flags before you're left crying into a pint of ice cream wondering why your soulmate couldn't keep it in their pants. First up, let's talk biology. Our brains are literally wired for both pair bonding and novelty. Evolution didn't give a shit about your marriage vows. Males especially are biologically programmed to spread their seed, which is why they're more likely to cheat for purely physical reasons. It's not an excuse, but it is a fact. Your man's ancestors who had multiple partners passed down more genes than the loyal ones. That doesn't mean men can't control themselves. They absolutely fucking can. But they're swimming upstream against millions of years of evolutionary programming. Women, on the other hand, tend to cheat for emotional reasons. Studies show women are more likely to stray when they feel emotionally neglected or undervalued. They're not usually looking for a quick fuck. They're looking for connection. That's why emotional affairs can sometimes be more devastating than physical ones. Your partner didn't just give away their body, they gave away their heart. There's also a fascinating chemical component here. When we fall in love, our brains are flooded with dopamine, oxytocin, and other feel-good chemicals. It's basically like being high, but that shit doesn't last forever. After about 12 to 18 months, those chemicals start to level off. This is when relationships transition from passionate love to companionate love. And guess what? Some people are literally addicted to that initial rush. They're chemical romance junkies, always chasing that next high. When the relationship stops giving them that dopamine hit, they look elsewhere for it. Scientists call this the Coolidge effect. Named after President Calvin Coolidge, it refers to the phenomenon where sexual interest is renewed by the introduction of new partners. The joke is that Coolidge and his wife were visiting a farm, and Mrs. Coolidge noticed a rooster mating frequently. She asked how often it happened, and the farmer said dozens of times a day. She said, tell that to the president. When the president heard this, he asked, same hen every time? The farmer said, no, different hens. The president said, tell that to Miss Coolidge. I guess you could say that Rooster was playing a real game of chicken with his relationships. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Now let's talk about your fucking brain. The prefrontal cortex, the part responsible for decision-making and impulse control, isn't fully developed until your mid-20s. That's why younger people are more likely to cheat. They literally don't have the brain hardware to fully think through consequences. So if you're dating a 22-year-old who can't stay faithful, their brain development might be partly to blame. Still doesn't make it okay, but it explains why college relationships often end up being a royal clusterfuck of infidelity. Here's another mind fuck for you. Narcissism and cheating go hand in hand. Studies show people with narcissistic traits are more likely to cheat because they literally think they deserve more than one partner. If your significant other thinks they're God's gift to humanity, well, they probably think they're God's gift to multiple people's beds too. Let's talk attachment styles because this shit is important. People with anxious attachment are more likely to cheat because they're constantly seeking validation. Avoidant attachers cheat to maintain emotional distance. And secure attachers? They're the least likely to cheat because they actually have their emotional shit together. So maybe instead of asking about someone's zodiac sign on the first date, ask about their attachment style. It might save you from a future why are there strange underwear in our bed conversation. Now, opportunity is a huge factor too. About 85% of affairs begin in the workplace. Why? Because proximity breeds familiarity, and familiarity can breed attraction. It's why so many affairs happen with coworkers, neighbors, or your partner's best friend. The more time spent together, the more likely feelings are to develop. So if your partner suddenly starts working late with that hot new colleague, you might want to raise an eyebrow. I'm not saying become a jealous psycho, but I am saying trust your gut when shit doesn't add up. Social media has fucked everything up too. It's never been easier to cheat. Sliding into DMs, reconnecting with exes, sexting, all of this can happen while your partner is sitting right next to you on the couch. Studies show that social media use increases the likelihood of both emotional and physical infidelity. It's like having a 24-7 buffet of potential hookups in your pocket. 
And we all know what happens at a buffet. People overeat just because they can. Let's talk about sexual satisfaction, or lack thereof. Research consistently shows that sexual dissatisfaction is one of the biggest predictors of cheating. If someone's needs aren't being met in the bedroom, they're more likely to look elsewhere. It's like being put on a starvation diet and then being surprised when you raid the fridge at midnight. Again, not an excuse. There's this magical thing called communication that should happen before cheating. But it's a factor. By the way, cheaters tend to be repeat offenders. The saying, once a cheater, always a cheater, has some scientific backing. Studies show that people who have cheated in one relationship are three times more likely to cheat in their next relationship. It's like they've crossed a moral boundary, and it's easier to cross it again. I guess you could say they're really committed to not being committed. Fuck, that was bad, but I couldn't resist. Know what's wild? There's actually a genetic component to cheating. Researchers have identified a gene variant linked to dopamine receptors that may make some people more prone to risk-taking behaviors, including infidelity. So some people might literally have cheating in their DNA. But let's be clear, having the gene doesn't mean you're destined to cheat. It just means you might need to work harder on impulse control. It's like having a genetic predisposition to alcoholism. You can still choose not to drink. Here's a pattern you should know about. People who are financially dependent on their partners are less likely to cheat. But people who have partners financially dependent on them are more likely to cheat. It's a fucked up power dynamic thing. So if your rich partner is flaunting their provider status, keep an eye out. They might think paying the bills buys them a hall pass for bad behavior. Let me drop this bomb too. People are more likely to cheat when they're about to hit a milestone age, like 29, 39, 49. It's called the search for meaning crisis. They're freaking out about getting older and trying to prove they've still got it. So if your partner is approaching one of these ages and suddenly buys a sports car and starts hitting the gym, it might not just be a midlife crisis. It might be pre-cheating behavior. And listen, social circles matter too. If your partner's friends are cheaters, they're more likely to cheat. Infidelity can actually be contagious in social networks. Your partner's friends might normalize it. Everyone does it, or it's just a little fun. So pay attention to how their friends talk about relationships. If they're all about side pieces and what happens in Vegas, that attitude could be rubbing off on your partner. I guess affair pressure is the new peer pressure. God, these puns are killing me, but not as much as cheating kills relationships. If you want to make your relationships affair-proof, here's what science suggests. Prioritize regular quality time together. Maintain physical intimacy, not just sex. Communicate openly about needs and desires. Establish clear boundaries with others and build trust through transparency. Basically, water your own fucking lawn so your partner isn't tempted to play in someone else's grass. I promise you the grass isn't greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. Now, let me get real with you for a second. If you're getting value from this reality check and want more science-based relationship truth bombs that might actually save your love life, hit that fucking subscribe button right now. Don't be like a cheater. Commit to something good for once. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications because unlike your ex, I'll always show up when I say I will with the content you need. Consider it relationship insurance for half the price of therapy and twice the honesty. In all seriousness, understanding the science behind cheating doesn't make it hurt less if it happens to you. But knowledge is power. When you know the risk factors and warning signs, you can either address issues before they lead to infidelity or get the fuck out before you get hurt. The worst thing is being blindsided by something you could have seen coming from a mile away. Remember, while science can explain cheating, it doesn't excuse it. People make choices, and those choices have consequences. So choose wisely, communicate openly, and maybe don't date someone with the cheater gene who's turning 39, has narcissistic tendencies, works with models, and has friends who are all on their third marriage. Just a thought. Now go use this knowledge to either strengthen your relationship or run like hell from the red flags you've been ignoring. Either way, you can thank me later.